Hi, I'm Adrian Bowles, founder of Storm Insights. We're offering new advisory services to help organizations evaluate and when it's appropriate to adopt uh, cognitive computing technologies to build more compelling applications. With all the hype and misinformation that's out there today, we decided to produce a series of short videos to explain the fundamental technology concepts and explore some of the business opportunities that present themselves with the adoption of cognitive computing. So let's begin with the definition. Cognitive computing is a problem-solving approach that uses hardware or software to approximate the form or function of a natural cognitive process. Major natural cognitive processes include learning, perception, and motivation. Learning is what the system must do. It's the critical defining process for cognitive computing. When we talk about learning in a cognitive computing sense, we're really talking about processes by which the system may improve its own performance based on experience rather than programming. Perception, or processing external stimuli in a natural sense, uh, relates to how we acquire the data for learning. Motivation guides the other processes. From an information processing perspective, it's really kind of the fuzziest of the three. All cognitive systems provide some type of response to external stimuli. The simplest approach is to take the structured output from another system, perform some processing or analysis, produce output or reports, and update the system memory based on feedback. At the higher end of cognitive computing systems, we loosen the interface requirements to permit input with little or no known structure. That could include video, images, or conversational natural language, which may also be used on the output side to solicit feedback on performance or request more data to improve confidence in an answer. This is where cognitive computing starts to really model perception. Regardless of the sophistication of the learning process or the types of sensory input, there are two basic but fundamentally different approaches to building cognitive computing solutions. The first is to build specialized hardware with processing elements that simulate neural activity. Those are called neuromorphic components or systems. The idea is to create processing elements based on a neural network model that learns by experience, specifically the experiences of the modeled neurons and synapses rather than by programming. A lot of neuromorphic research today is government-sponsored and university-based, but the commercial possibilities have attracted some serious attention from large firms and startups. IBM is making significant contributions to the Synapse Project funded by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. In the picture, you can see a Synapse board from IBM that I placed on the back of my iPad to provide a sense of scale. IBM reports a goal of building a neurosynaptic chip system with 10 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses that consumes only one kilowatt of power and is contained in a system with a volume less than two liters. So while there's a lot of academic interest, and this is an interesting research problem, the bigger commercial motivation is the development of systems that can process big data and also deliver higher performance with lower power and real estate requirements. Qualcomm, which manufactures telecommunications components found in handsets and systems around the world, is also very active in this area. In fact, just last week, Qualcomm advertised job openings for senior systems engineers and cognitive devices, specifically to, quote, enable the next generation of mobile devices to see, read, feel, and predict user behavior. This isn't science fiction. Qualcomm's zeroth neuromorphic chip is expected to be in commercial applications next year. The second major approach is to create a functional equivalent to natural cognitive process without attempting to model the biological mechanisms. Unlike the neural modeling approaches, which are often hardware-centric and usually uh, include analog components, most of the software-centric cognitive computing approaches are built on off-the-shelf hardware. The version of IBM Watson that played Jeopardy, for example, ran on off-the-shelf power series hardware. We'll close with a look at a model we're working on now to help clients evaluate business opportunities to adopt cognitive computing. It's important to note that this isn't a maturity model. You don't need to build from the bottom up. You could build applications that leverage higher level components in isolation. So for example, you might use conversational natural language processing as a query tool for problems with simple deterministic answers. At the bottom, level zero is the foundation, things that enable cognitive computing, but are not actually cognitive processes or workloads. We can include other enablers, like massively parallel architectures. This is the infrastructure layer. Level one is focused on a variety of learning processes. Learning can be static or dynamic and continuous based on experience. Level two considers the way system communicates uh, input and output with users. Confidence-weighted reporting goes hand in hand with learning in a probabilistic system, one that offers uh, multiple answers weighted by confidence. So we're contrasting a probabilistic system 
with a deterministic system. The deterministic has one right answer, probabilistic, there are many answers uh, that are going to be ranked in terms of confidence or evidence. Levels two and three start to cover the perception processes we mentioned earlier. A level three solution could include sensor or sensory input from a variety of sources, nearby or remote. Finally, for now, the unlabeled level four foreshadows future generations of cognitive computing, where we can look at the um, aspects of uh, natural processing like motivation. Look for more cognitive computing videos on our YouTube channel. Among other topics, we'll be covering learning in much more detail, um, some advances in natural language processing, and provide overviews of the various cognitive technology submarkets and talk about the vendors that are emerging in each of those spaces and then look at what it takes to develop cognitive computing applications in your own environment. Thanks for joining us.